And then she pauses. She said, Mr. Stewart, would you be interested in adopting this baby? Hey, I'm Davey Rothbart, and I host a podcast called Found, where we look at the stories behind lost and found notes, letters, photos, even a found baby. Over the years, Alex Bloomberg and I, we've collaborated on a ton of stories for This American Life. And if you like the great storytelling on Startup, I think you'll really love Found. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Wondery.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah, we're going. Where are we going? Where are we going? Do we ever really know? In this case, I actually do. My wife, Nazneen, and I are going on a rare night out to dinner. My mom is in town. She's watching the kids. And Nazneen and I have a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, so, yes. let me start here. Mm. How much debt are we in? <laughs> oh, God. Are you going to put this in the podcast? I... I I feel like this might be a line that we cannot cross for the podcast. Like, personally, how much debt are we in? Yeah. Um, all I will say is that we are in more debt than I have ever been in my life. From Gimlet, you're listening to Startup, the podcast about what it's really like to start a business. And today, what it's really like, I have a small cold. That's why my voice sounds different. I mean, really, we, we should not be doing anything. Like, we shouldn't be... We should be going to, to dinner. dinner. We should be opening up a can of beans at home. <laughs> Campbell's pork and beans. We're at episode 10. Episode 10, people. I never thought we would ever get this far. Regular listeners know I've been chronicling the launching of my podcast company, which started as a pathetic pitch on a sidewalk near a Los Angeles strip mall, has actually turned into a company with two podcasts up, more podcasts on the way, employees, money in the bank. Today on the program, what we're spending that money on. Also, some sage advice from a Florida pizza baron. So on this walk to the restaurant on our rare night out, my wife Nazanin and I talked about how we got into debt in the first place. It started when I became an employee of the company I'd started. Before taking a job with myself, I'd been getting a pretty good salary. I'd been working in public radio, sure, but I'd been working there for a while, and I was effectively too highly paid for me to hire myself. So I accepted the job for myself at what amounted to a 75% pay cut. And before I go any further, I want to acknowledge we're fine. My wife has a good job as a TV producer. We're not going to starve. It's simply to say that a 75% pay cut, you feel that. And things that we used to have money for, holiday trips, for example, four plane tickets to the grandparents for Thanksgiving— that goes on the credit card now. But, you know, holidays, they're almost over. I don't think we'll go into any more into debt. Like, I think we're going to be okay. I don't know. You know what I worry about is that, like, I feel like you don't have a very realistic sense of money. You're just really, you're like an optimistic person. And I feel like that works against you when it comes to money. Uh, so should we talk about money? Let's talk about money. So I went through... This is my co-founder, Matt, and I, early December. And one of the reasons we haven't been paying ourselves very much, we don't want to add any more than we have to to the spending side of the business until we have a clearer picture of how the business is doing financially. And so today, we're sitting down for the first time to take a look at that. And um, these are all approximate numbers, but they're correct. It's been three months since the first episode of Startup, a month, roughly, since the launch of our second show, Reply All. We have an office, we have eight employees, we're paying salaries and benefits, and we're getting revenue from the ads that we've been running on the shows, ads that you'll be hearing in another 10 minutes or so. What we don't know is, how is this all adding up? How much are we spending per month? How much are we bringing in? By way of comparison, Matt pulls up an old spreadsheet that we'd built over the summer, a three-year, month-by-month projection, basically a picture we drew back then, before we started, of what we thought the future would look like. This massive Excel file. It's oh, yeah. so oh, I remember that. Look at so that. So much more detail than we need. A lot of things are going basically the way we imagined it. We saw ourselves having two shows up and running by this point. We figured we'd be at this number of employees. Where we miscalculated was in our assumptions of how many people would be listening to those shows. Um, so, yeah, this is audience per episode. 
this line here. Uh, and so we were projecting, so P1, where are we right now? In a, in a uh, we're team? now in P, so we launched in September, so in September, October, November, we're here. How is this possible? This, this, we, do we really believe this? Uh, we said we were going to have 20,000 listeners after four months. <laughs> and we have more than 10 times that. And because of those strong audience numbers, 10 times more than what we were expecting, we're also bringing in more revenue than we thought we would be at this point. So even though we're still operating at a loss... We go like by March, April, we should reasonably expect to be cash flow positive. In our projections from before we started, we didn't think we'd break even until the summer of 2016. So overall, fantastic news. But also, it raises some questions. The fact that things are so much further ahead of schedule means that a lot of the other assumptions we made don't hold up as well. So, for example, we thought in the plan that we drew up over the summer, we'll get three shows launched, and then we'll spend a year, a full year, growing the audience and growing the revenue for those shows. And then, once we've got it all figured out, we'll launch our next couple of shows. But looking at the numbers today, that plan doesn't make as much sense. I've been feeling like the plan doesn't feel, it feels too slow now. Like, I feel like it, like things have changed so much. It would be nice to sort of like start building out some other shows sooner rather than later. I feel like we've already learned, we know a lot now. And like, you know, the fact that we're so far ahead on our projections means that we could safely, you know, start spending more money. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're ahead of where we wanted to be. Yeah. But I don't know, like, I don't know, like, how... Matt and I went back and forth about this. Should we start spending money now, getting more shows in the pipeline earlier than we'd expected? Or should we stick to the original plan? Three shows this year, nothing more until 2016. And ramping up our spending now, even though we're doing better than we thought, it is scary. Sure, things look good now, but will that continue? Will our audience continue to show up? And behind this anxiety, there is another bigger anxiety. An artistic anxiety, I guess you could call it. Can we make things that are good, that people want to listen to? We're trying to make hits, you know, and hits, they're hard to make. There's not really a formula. In fact, what makes a hit a hit is often it has something new or fresh or unexpected that people haven't heard before. It takes time and skill and luck to come up with a hit. And money. I mean, it's just, I, it's, it's just, there's a lot, there's a lot of, un, there are so many uncertainties. This is my producer, Caitlin. And as we here at Gimlet were discussing this episode of Startup and this tension that's at the center of it, I realized that Caitlin shared a lot of the same anxieties that Matt and I did. But her perspective is a little bit different. She was our first hire. She's been here from the beginning, back before the podcast launched. And she's listened to and transcribed every interview I've done. So she and I sat down to talk about this decision that Matt and I had recorded ourselves talking about. Okay, like, startup is going well and we're launching Reply All, but, like, right now, like, as it is, you are spread super thin. You're running over to Reply All to edit them and then coming back and doing, like, edits early in the morning and, and staying late. And, it's, and, and so the solution would be, okay, let's bring on another editor. and That's really expensive. And then there's hiring people and... Um, and those, you know, they're, those are all expenses. And, like, what if you don't make the right hire? What if you just choose someone who turns out to be total crap? And then you have, you have, you have that expense on multiple levels. Um, uh, um, you're taking on a lot of the worry and anxiety about this. Yeah, I mean, when I first started working for you and Matt um, last summer— I was logging all this tape, like hours of tape and probably 80 hours that I spent listening to you and Matt before I really ever had a conversation with either of you. And so I feel like I just know you guys better than you know I know you. (laughs) Um, You spend that much time listening to someone argue about a name or a pitch. It's hard not to feel like you're really invested in it. 
I guess there's sort of this feeling. I think what's sort of dancing around uh-huh. this conversation is that, like, is the thought that there could become a moment where it doesn't feel as risky. Exactly. Yeah. I mean. And I don't think there will. Really? No. Like, I think there's a danger of not growing. And that danger has to do with this other thing that's hanging over this whole discussion. A little podcast you might have heard of called Serial. Probably heard of it. It's a digital program that has taken the world by storm. Everyone's heard about it. It's gone to the number one podcast in the UK. 850,000 people per episode. Please welcome Sarah Koenig. Serial, if you don't know, and I guess I have to do this, right? It's a serialized podcast launched by my former colleagues at This American Life in which they essentially reinvestigate a murder that took place in 1999. It's amazing. If you haven't heard it, download it now. It's entirely worth it. And also, just as an aside, if you're listening to the sound of my voice right now and you have not heard of Serial, you occupy a very strange niche in culture. And I'd like to hear more about you, frankly. Seriously, if this moment is the very first time you've heard of the podcast Serial, tweet at me, at Abex Lundberg. I want to hear your story. But anyway, the point is, Serial is the most successful podcast in history. As you can see, you are the world's first superstar podcaster. (laughs) It's leading a vanguard of reinventing the form, and it's made everyone realize that the potential audience for podcasting is much bigger than anyone originally believed. Lots of serial fans are out there now looking for new stuff to listen to in that same vein, stuff that's highly produced and narrative, stuff that's like what we're trying to do. But serial was in development for a long time. Some of the most talented people in radio working for over a year. To do something that comes close to that level of quality, we need to start laying the groundwork now. Clearly, like, there's an opportunity. We need to seize the opportunity. The market is growing faster than we thought. Like, there is a moment here, and it's a moment that we can capture, and that argues for doing more. You're feeling that, too? Completely. So Matt and I went over the numbers. Okay. Back on the walk with Nazneen, I told her about the conversations Matt and I had and how we're doing better than we thought, but that means that probably we're going to spend more money than we thought we would be at this point as well. And I also told her what that all boils down to for her. So it means that I feel like we can't, we still can't pay myself, we, we still can't pay me very much money. You right. know, which means that uh, it's sort of on you still. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, are you? Would you like to know how I feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I feel like I feel sort of, you know. I mean, I I feel pretty uncomplicated about that. Like, I feel like, you know, when I'm when I met you. I was, I didn't have a job and, you know, I was making, when I did get a job, I was making very little money and I had a bunch of graduate school debt and like there's never a moment where you made me feel like I'm paying for your, I'm paying for you to be able to like figure out what you're going to do and have a career and, you know, um, so I feel sort of proud that I can, I feel kind of proud of it, like, that I can make enough money so we have to go into a lot of debt. (laughs) But at the same time, I'm like also really worried (laughs) about it all, like, you know what I mean? Like I, the, the, the anxiety and the, like, any bad feeling I have is associated with like, just, just being worried about money. You don't feel, you don't feel like trapped. Like, cause, cause oh, I me- feel trapped. Because I am trapped. <laughs> like, we're both trapped. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm trapped, but, like, I don't know. I, it's okay. <laughs> Coming up, lessons from the pizza man after these words from our sponsor. 
This episode of Startup is brought to you by the clothing company, Frank & Oak. If you want to find the latest styles, if you want clothes that will just look good without you having to think about it, Frank & Oak can do that for you. And if you answer a few questions online about your sartorial preferences, they even have personal stylists who will handpick specific looks just for you. Let's say you don't want to answer questions about your sartorial preferences. Let's say you don't know what sartorial preferences are. But let's say you still want a complete on-trend outfit. And let's say you don't know what on trend is either. That's fine too. Frank and Oak can help. They have these complete outfits ready to go. I'm on the site right now. Here's what I'm seeing. There's this one slim young man with a crisp blue Oxford shirt. It's buttoned all the way to the top, I'm noticing. They've matched it with a pair of rolled up gray chinos. I had no idea you were supposed to be doing these things. Rolling up your chinos, buttoning your shirts to the top. I'm doing that from now on. Frank and Oak, they'll help you get in the know about the latest fashion trends. Right now, Frank and Oak is running a special offer for new customers. You can get a complete men's outfit that's a pair of pants and a shirt for just $79. Get your first men's outfit for $79 at frankandoak.com slash startup. That's Frank, like the name, A-N-D, Oak, like the tree, dot com slash startup. Startup is sponsored by Squarespace. With Squarespace, you don't need to know code or be a developer to have your own beautiful and professional-looking website. That's because Squarespace has really smart developers who create tools that you can use to make your own website. People like Cole Krumholtz, who's the engineering lead for the developer platform at Squarespace. And Cole loves his job. He's a natural at it. He's been doing it since he was a kid. Anytime that you get to build something with software, it's both creative and imaginative. Pretty early on, it was a it was a way that I could sort of make fun of my brother in a pretty effective way. I wrote this little program and I told my brother to sit down and to use it. And the program asked him, what's your name and what's your favorite color and a couple of other simple things. And then no matter what answers he wrote in, it would at the end sort of evaluate his personality and tell him something like, you're a dork. Um, <laughs> Which, which was much more effective than me calling him a dork. To have the computer tell him that he was a dork was a new and difficult thing for him to grapple with. Squarespace. Making it so you don't have to be an engineering whiz kid to torment your little brother. Anyone can do it now. And make it beautiful, too. Right now, use the offer code STARTUP to get 10% off your first purchase. That's squarespace.com offer code STARTUP to get 10% off. I want to do something a little different here. One of the things, the unexpected things that's happened since we launched the show is that so many people have reached out to share their own stories about starting companies. Some offer advice or encouragement. Others want to commiserate. And I started calling some of these folks up just to talk to them. These conversations, they've been really interesting. One, it's just interesting to hear how other people have done this thing that I'm trying to do. But two... They have a lot of great advice, and it's not the usual advice you might get from reading a business book or something like that. The advice that comes out of these conversations seems more hard-won, more precise. And I want to play one of those conversations right now. It's with a guy who runs an operation in Gainesville, Florida. I can hear you. Yeah, you're not getting any mic level. Why not? Why not? Uh, let's see if there's a way to boost mic level here. This is your job, man. You're supposed to know how to do this stuff real good. I know. He and I talked a while back when our studio was still a bit of a work in progress. But eventually, I got things working. Just First of all, just tell, tell, tell me who you are just get on, so you can get your name on tape. What's your name and, and what, what's your business? Well, my name is Satchel Ray, and I'm an artist who runs a pizza joint. So one of the things that I feel like I know about you that our listeners don't know about you is your wonderfully, amazingly insane website. Uh, Could you just describe well, your website? My, the guy who does my website, he tells me all the time, every time I see him, every month or so, like that it's probably the only website on the internet that's in Flash. <laughs> and I don't really know what that means. Honestly, I don't either, but I get the drift. Satchel's website, satchelspizza.com, is a throwback. That's definitely what it feels like when you're on it. In, in the restaurant, in, in the, the physical restaurant, we add things all the time. It's, it's, it's hard for you to go in and not see something that you haven't seen before. Uh-huh. And, and I want the website to reflect that somehow. So it does. I'm always trying to add new little 
things on the website. So what was the latest thing that you added to this to the website? What was the latest? Oh, uh, let's see. I think we. I think the latest thing was the party squirrel. Oh, the little squirrel that's popping up here with a little red beret. Yeah, the squirrel in the beret. Oh, I see. Oh, oh, look. No, so I didn't even know that. So I just saw this little squirrel popping up, but then you you roll your mouse over it, and and he and he pops up higher, and it's revealed that he has a little French style mustache with the. With and, he, <laughs> and he says, "Do you party?" <laughs> And then if you if you scroll over gift cards, you'll see a picture of me pop up. Oh, oh, hold on. Oh, there you are. So a website like that, I wanted to know the story. Satchel told me. His dad had been disabled with a brain tumor when Satchel was a kid. His dad wasn't able to do much but sit in a chair all day. Satchel got a job in high school working at a local pizzeria, and the proprietor there became a father figure to him. Taught him all about making pizza and running a restaurant. In college, Satchel went to art school, then became a hippie. Spent a lot of his youth traveling, coming back and working out jobs and taking off again. Jamaica, Mexico, all over the U.S. Eventually, though, he got older and started thinking, I need to make a living now. I remember in my 20s, I thought, if I could just find some rich guy to give me $10,000 a year, I could just paint all the time, and they could, they could have my paintings. Maybe I get to keep one or two, but... I didn't really find a way there, but I did grow up uh, making pizza, and I knew how to make pizza. So I decided that I would open a restaurant, and if nothing else, it would give me a place to hang my my painting. If you said that to the people in your life at that time, how many of them thought you were actually going to succeed in doing that? Well, not many. I mean, not many did did think I could succeed, but, you know, I, I came from a pretty strict Southern Baptist upbringing. Uh-huh. And so, you know, you didn't drink or, or smoke or have sex or anything and dance. I mean, we, 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 were real, we were real strict Southern Baptists. And so while I did stray from the straight and narrow in my 20s a little bit, I still had the core foundation of, um, of a spiritual background and of, um, you know, I, my mom, who took care of my dad um, when he was handicapped, she had to become the breadwinner, the mother, the father. She had to take out the garbage, mow the grass, go to night school. So I never had a problem with work ethic. I love working. I love building things, making things. So of, of the stuff that I'm going through right now, trying to launch this business, um, does, does any of it feel familiar to you? Well, I, I tell you, I remember a lot from opening my restaurant in 2003, and it was I, I was there day and night, and my son was one, a little over one years old, and I was just thinking, is this going to work? What am I going to do to make this work? And I just, I, my mind was struggling all the time. How can I make this catch on? And um, in some ways, you, you you're struggling trying to figure out if it's going to work and, and how it's going to work as well. Um, you know, you, you seem to have a, a lot more access to capital. And so that's <laughs> a good thing because that, that really helps get yeah. things off the ground. Yes, it does. But, you know, we, we struggled for a while and then it caught on and it caught on more and more. And now I don't have to worry anymore because it's always busy and people love it. And uh-huh. so my whole idea of, of, of being able to be an artist and, and have a pizza restaurant work. And, and I spend probably more time making art than making pizza now. I mean, I was, I wanted, I wanted to build concrete sculptures in my yard. And my wife was like, no way you're crazy. And so the restaurant gave me a place to build these concrete sculptures. And, and so the restaurant gave me the outlet to be uh-huh. able to express all the art and the folk art that I, that I had inside me and I wanted to express. You became your own Rich guy to support you. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> How rich did you get, by the way? <laughs> well, you know, that's a sensitive subject because, <laughs> you know, there's people who think my pieces are too expensive. Uh-huh. But my goal is to, is to pay people really well uh-huh. and to have um, a really have a low turnover rate for employees and have employees that are really happy. But, you know, we did over $2 million last year in, in sales. Wow. And 
I was able to, uh, in the, in the economy downturn, I was able to buy a house, you know, at the beach nearby. Right. You know, you're quick to describe yourself as an artist who, who happens to be an entrepreneur, but it also seems like you definitely have a knack for making money. Um, and I was wondering, did, did you hear the episode where where one of my investors, Chris Saka, was was trying to was talking about me, and he said, "I can't tell if you're like actually want to build a big company or whether you're just trying to do an art project here." Yeah, yeah, I like that. That was good because uh, you, you know you're you're. The, I, I don't know how frank I can be here. You can be totally but- frank. You, you sound like such a bumbling idiot talking to the guy, and, and and I'm sitting here cringing like, oh my god, this guy, you know, like he's got all this money, he's you know, Twitter or whatever. Like I don't know who that was before your podcast, but uh-huh. to hear you talk to him, I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. But you know, the thing is, people, I think they're endeared to artists. Like that, that's to me what you're trying to do. You're just an artist who's trying to, to, to become a businessman or an entrepreneur. And there's nothing wrong with that. It, it's just, it's just, uh, thank God for good friends who know how to work QuickBooks. Because I do think that, that you're an artist trying to do something really big in it. And, and it's a good thing you've got, you know, that partner because he seems like, you know, he, he's got a good mind for business. He's and amazing. he can help you put that, that part of it together. Yeah. He's but, amazing. And that's, really the secret of my success yeah. has been all the good people that I have around me that help me make things happen, whether it be the gift shop or managing the prep uh-huh. or the office. I mean, I surround myself with people who are positive and who can solve problems. Right. And when I do that, my whole enterprise flourishes. And I think that's probably what you're going to do as well. Like, it's more important for you to, to see your vision and to make a lot of money. And then I think when when people think that way, they end up making money anyway. Yeah, I hope so. We'll have scenes from an upcoming episode of Startup in a moment. But first... Coming up on a future episode of Startup, we return to a question that's been central to this whole series. What kind of a company are we anyway? Are we a content company? Are we a technology company? We talked to somebody who knows a lot about technology, Marco Arment, who helped build Tumblr, the blogging platform. You're one of the premier app developers in the world, so you would be sort of like the perfect choice for that third member. But you're saying that's not a worthy goal. No, as we were listening to that in the car this weekend, and my wife and I were yelling at the radio, saying, no, that's wrong, don't do that. Listen to your wife, she's right, do not do this. And, by the way, your wife's advice has been amazing on this show. <laughs> you should definitely listen to her more than almost anyone else you've talked to, or actually more than anyone else you've talked to that I've heard. That's coming up on a future episode of Startup. To subscribe to the podcast, go to iTunes and subscribe, or check out the Gimlet Media website, gimletmedia.com. It was designed in partnership with Athletics. They designed the brand new Gimlet logo, also the new Reply All logo. Reply All, by the way, is the brand new show we launched about the internet. It is amazing. If you haven't heard it yet, please go and subscribe. Reply All. You can find it on iTunes or at GiveUpMedia.com. You can also find everything you need to know about the music we used on today's show on our website. Special thanks today to Build Buildings, who wrote and performed our special ad music. Mark Phillips wrote and performed our theme song. Editing help from Lisa Chow, Starly Kine, and Caitlin Roberts, who also produced the show. And if I could ask a special favor of everybody, I learned something about iTunes rankings recently that I want to just test out. Apparently, if people rate the show, it helps you go up in the rankings. I don't know if it's true, but I really want to test it out. If you get a chance, go ahead and rate Startup in the iTunes store. Let's see what it does. Thanks so much to everybody for listening. You can follow us on Twitter at Podcast Startup, or you can follow me at Abex Lumberg, or you can follow the company at Gimlet Media. I'm Alex Bloomberg. I'll talk to you soon on the next episode of Startup. Hold nice. this. You're never supposed to let your interview subject hold the mic. <laughs> Radio 101. <laughs> 
Thanks to our sponsor, Frank and Oak. Frank and Oak is a clothing company that's all about offering the latest styles for busy people. Right now, Frank and Oak is running a special offer for new customers. You can get a complete men's outfit that's a pair of pants and a shirt for $79. Get your first men's outfit for $79 at frankandoak.com slash startup. That's Frank, like the name, A-N-D, Oak, like the tree, dot com slash startup. Special thanks to our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to build a beautiful website, portfolio, or online store. Remember to use the offer code STARTUP to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace. Build it beautiful.